Okay, so we're going to start this webinar. So, okay, uh, hello everyone and all the people that is following us by the streaming in, in Google Plus. So welcome to our first web seminar of this series of the Latin American webinars of physics. So my name is Roberto Linero from IFIC in Valencia and I'm going to be the host of this session. So first of all, uh, our speaker is Germán. Uh, Gómez Vargas from Catholic University of Chile and ENFN Roma Tor Vergata, and who will talk about the uh, gravitinos and the AMS positron anomaly. Uh, uh, Germán has received his PhD from the University of Autónoma de Madrid, and nowadays he's postdoc working in indirect search of dark matter, and he's member of the Fermi Lab Collaboration and CTA Consortium at the uh, University Católica of Chile. So Herman's talk today is titled New AMS O2 Positron Fraction and Thermilat Extragalactic Gamma Ray Background Measurements versus Gravitino Dark Matter. We're glad uh, to have him as our speaker today. And let me remind you that uh, you can make questions during the uh, Herman's talk. For people that is following us by the streaming, there is a tool around here in this part is to make the questions and answers. You, you have to write the question, and then at the end of the Herman's talk, we're going to read the question, and Herman is going to answer. So, and also you can make questions using Twitter with the hashtag LAWOP. And, okay, Herman, you can start whenever you, you want. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be the first speaker in this uh, series of webinars. Uh, well, a part of the organization, I hope this will be very fruitful that we will have a lot of viewers in YouTube. Then uh, I will share my screen so you can see my presentation. Okay, I hope everyone is watching my presentation right now, right? Yes, everybody can see the, your presentation. Okay, well, I will talk about a work that we, we did here in the yeah. Catholic University. Um, you can find the, you can find the uh, paper on archive, and it is about uh, the new AMS2 positron fraction and the Fermi Lat extragalactic gamma ray background, we are confronting these um, measurements through the gravitino dark matter. Okay, let me start with the motivation for dark matter. Uh, the basic thing about dark matter as particle is that it can explain different phenomena, different discrepancies that we see at uh, a galactic scale and cosmological scales, and then we have this. Um, very impressive uh, evidences at uh, last the uh, galactic rotation curves in uh, spiral galaxies. We also have uh, colliding clusters where the dark matter component is well separated from the baryonic component. Also, we have cosmological proofs. Uh, and Planck provide us this very nice uh, measurement of the where where dark matter is composed almost 27% of the uh, matter content of the universe. And also we had this very new result, is 2015, uh, Fabio Yoko, Miguel Pato, and Gianfranco Bertone present these uh, evidences for uh, dark matter inside our galaxy in the inner part. It's very, it's very nice, this work is very recent, it's published in Nature, and you can well, you can follow this. It's, it's a very nice proof that there is some mis mass in, in the inner part of our own galaxy. Okay, also, there is a motivation, extra motivation for dark matter, that this is now part of our um, culture. You can, well, it has influenced also the art, and uh, because, well, it's, it's something that uh, is uh, it's very impressive that is big part of the universe and we have no idea what it is. 
then the idea to test the, the hypothesis that dark matter is made of fundamental particles uh, is to basically detect signals, not gravitational signals of these particles. Then we have um, basically three strategies. One strategy following this um, uh, scheme, general scheme, is that dark matter can interact with uh, standard molar particles. Then if you follow the arrow from up down, then you will see what we call dire detection or direct search for dark matter, in which dark matter interact with standard model, it gives some energy to the standard model, that is uh, standard model particles that are made uh, a detector, then we have different experiments to somehow you can uh, detect this uh, deposition in the detector, then we had CMS, CDMS, Xenon, and they have a very nice result, but I won't focus on this. Also, uh, in looking the, the scheme in this direction, you can you can produce dark matter in accelerators. If you collide standard more particle like in the LHC, in principle you could produce dark matter. Then you can you can see some signals of dark matter. And the last option is uh, going in this direction, from left to right. Then, in case dark matter is stable in some region of the space where dark matter is, uh, where you have high, higher concentration of dark matter, they can collide. They can collide uh, somehow and then produce standard model particles. Those standard model particles will propagate in the interstellar medium and then reach the air. And then with our detectors, in principle, we can detect those signals. I will talk, talk more about this in this uh, very nice scheme. You can see that uh, if you have dark matter particle, it can decay or annihilate. In case uh, it decays somehow, producing standard model particles in inter inter interstellar medium, then basically it will modify the intensity and distribution of cosmic rays that we detect in the air. Then you can have neutral particles as well as charged particles. The problem with uh, charged particles is that they will propagate in the interstellar medium which have um, uh, magnetic fields that will, well, you will lose the, the initial, the, the production of this, then it will be somehow uh, uh, random travel till the air. Instead, gamma rays can trace back the origin of the decay. And, but let's see what is the composition of uh, the cosmic rays that we, well, that reach the air. Then basically almost all the cosmic rays are nucleons. If you see in this plot, I have energy uh, versus uh, flux of different cosmic ray species, you have that you can see that the amount of uh, protons in this plot is uh, significantly higher than the amount of ele electrons or positrons that reach the air. Then uh, we have exotic particles there. Okay. Then now let me talk about what is uh, the region what we think is the region of those cosmic rays in our galaxy. Then the primary cosmic rays, with those are uh, cosmic rays produced that are injected in the interstellar medium from some astronomical sources. The known sources of uh, cosmic rays are supernova remanents. We know that they produce basically protons and electrons. They accelerate protons and electrons, uh, among other particles. But also we can have secondary production of cosmic rays. It is due to the collision of these primary cosmic rays with, with particles in the interstellar mediums. 
is basically protons colliding with hydrogen. The galaxy is full of hydrogen. And then you produce uh, secondaries. You produce electrons or positrons. The problem is that we have, we, we don't know any source of primary positrons. Then you can have some unknown source of positrons producing um, some signals. I will, I will come on this later. Then, uh, if we are interested, it uh, serves for signal of dark matter. This is a very good place because, well, uh, the, the amount of uh, positrons that you produce from astrophysical source is not well known and is expected to be very low. Then, if you have uh, dark matter producing positrons, it will be almost background free. Okay, then uh, in this war we test the gravitino dark matter. This is a very good candidate for, for being the dark matter of the universe in models where, in supersymmetric models, where air parity is broken. Because when air parity is not broken, the, well, the most um, popular candidate is the neutralino. Uh, but if air parity is broken, the neutralino can decay faster than expected and needed to be the dark matter of the universe. Then, in that case, uh, the gravitino is a good candidate. Uh, because uh, its lifetime is very long, okay? Um, the gravitino can be produced also in the early universe, and then basically done in the the reheating temperature, you can get the right amount of dark matter that we see today. Then the gravitino is a very well motivated candidate, and especially in these air parity violation um, models with a bilinear air parity violation model, you can have the the decays, the possible decays that you you see here, basically through uh, neutrinos, uh, gamma rays. Then you you can produce those particles, those standard model particles in the out there in, in the space. Then if those particles propagate till the air, in principle you can detect. And then now let me talk about how we can um, detect those particles. Basically I will talk about the AMS detector. Uh, this is a particle physics experiment installed on the International Space Station and basically it measures cosmic refractions and also its composition in the GEP to TEV range. This is very important because this is not very well explored. Uh, one of the main objectives of this mission is to provide information on the cosmic ray origin and how they propagate in the interstellar medium and also very interesting object of this experiment is to search for dark matter signals. Then I am presenting here a result that they published last year, well at the end of the last year in September in the physical review letters and uh, it was about the positron fraction. Basically what they measure was the flux well, the, the relation between the number of positrons and the sum of positrons and electrons. This is a very clean measurement because all the sentences, all the systematics due to the instrument can be taken away because it's a ratio, it's a ratio you just not only count numbers. Well, there is a big challenge because, well, I, I just, as I already mentioned, the number of electrons and positron is, is, is very is very low in comparison with other particles, especially protons. The, the discrimination between electrons and positrons is, is it's a tricky part of this measurement, but it's a very clean measurement. 
it was made before by Pamela, also by Fer by Fermi. They confirmed the rise. Then, what is the spectacular thing of this new result? Basically, that at higher energies, around um, uh, 300 GeVs, it stopped increasing. Then there is uh, some uh, zero crossing there. This is very important because it allows us to model better what is the SARS or what is the phenomena behind this rise. Why? Because all the well, all the conversion and propagation models they predict that this positron fraction will reduce when energy increases, and then this rise is very significant and is not explained but uh, normal models, conventional models. Okay. The other measurement that they present, that this is another physical review letters uh, published on the same day, is the flux, independent flux of electrons and positrons. You can see here. This is a more tricky measurement because, well, it's, uh, you, you have more instrument involved in, in this. And then the conclusion of this is that uh, there is a rise in the positron fraction and this rise is due to the, an excess of positron, not to the loss of electrons. This is very important. This is a new piece of information in the quest for for, for determine what is the source of these uh, high energy positrons. Then there are non-exotic interpretation with non-exotic interpretation, I mean uh, pulsars, uh, pulsar with nebula, and uh, this is a very nice work by, well, one of the author is uh, our host, uh, Roberto. Uh, basically, the idea is that you can explain this, assuming that uh, pulsars produce uh, electrons and positrons, okay? Uh, it has some difficulties, I point here, that basically uh, this assumption that pulsar will never produce uh, positron and electrons in equal amount is an assumption. And also, well, you, the, you don't have a, a precise way to calculate how many electrons, positrons, and what is the spectrum that they have. Uh, when they are injected in the interstellar medium. Then, uh, this uh, issue about what is the source of the high energy positron is, is open, okay? Then, here, the uh, AMS collaboration made this very minimal model to fit the data, basically, uh, modeling the flux, well, you, you forget about all the physics there, you just put a model for the background, this is the, the green part of the equation, then you have a model for the flux of electrons, one model for flux of positrons. Then you have uh, this um, power law modeling for the background, what we call background, all the primaries for electrons, the background are uh, primary electrons, and secondary production of electrons, and um, for positron, are only secondary positrons, okay? This green part. And then you add this source term. This source term is modeled like, uh, basically like a power law with a exponential cutoff. And then what is nice here is that this source is modeled in the same way. It's the same source for electrons and positrons. When they fit the data, they find these results. They fit the positron fraction, the electron plus electron flux, and they find that uh, well, the conclusion is that you can fit the data, you can describe the data with a common source of electrons and positrons. This is a very interesting result. It means that there is a there can be a source out there in the space producing an equal amount of electrons and positrons. Then, what we did in our work was say, well, we have the gravity notar matter that 
also has this property. The gravity you know, can produce electrons and positrons in the same amount. Also, the gravity you know, is out there. And uh, let's see if we can fit this source term with the gravity you know, decays. Then, basically, what I am showing here is, well, our proposal is to put, well, this is not a new proposal, but uh, we are testing this with the new data. It's, uh, let's see what happens when we use the gravity you know, as the source term. Then, uh, here, the signal will be basically this model. Uh, the flux of gravitinos, then they are produced in um, in the um, basically close to the, the galactic center. They propagate here. You have the equation of the propagation. Basically, you have this is the the injected spectrum of electrons or positrons. They are produced in equal amount. And equally, uh, somewhere in the galaxy, they are propagated to this function, function till the air. And then this is the flux that you will reach here. And of course, it depends on um, which channels you have for decay. Okay? Then this will be the source that you, the number of photons, uh, the number of electrons and positrons you will have in the air. Okay? Then to make this. Basically, you need to compute uh, the spectrum, how many electrons and positrons you can produce with the gravitino decay. Here, on the left side, here, this is the spectrum that you produce. You just use P PTA to see what is the spectrum of each decay channel. We have these four different decay channels. We restrain ourselves to two body case. It means that we are in a specific uh, supersymmetric model, be linear. And then, basically, you need to put to calculate this bar. That is the spectrum with PTA. We calculate this. This is the electron uh, spectra, but also you can produce gamma rays in the same decays. Okay. Then you have here, this is the flux of electrons that you will detect here in the air. And this is the flux of photons that you will detect here in the air. Next step, you need to propagate those electrons and positrons from wherever in the galaxy they are produced till the air. Then here I'm showing uh, the spectrum, the flux of electrons and positrons for uh, different gravitino mass. This is what the spectrum, the flux that we will see in the air. Okay, this is what we can compare with the data. Then we use the data. You can see here on the left the data. The data is the positron flux, uh, the electron flux, and the positron fraction. We use all this data. Uh, we perform a global fit to this data with this spectral model. The three parameters of the fit are the lifetime of the gravitino, the branching ratios. We we don't uh, we don't fix the branching ratio to theoretical expectation. We just let them moving free in the fit, and then we fit the background and the signal at the same time. Then this is what we have. We can see that uh, for some specific parameters, we can fit the data. You can see here the positron fraction, it will fit. We present three cases for one, two, and three TB gravitinos. Then what we find is that uh, the main decay mode is W tau. And the branching ratios that we find in fit are in agreement at one sigma with uh, the theoretical expectation. The theoretical expectation, I will talk later about this, is to have uh, uh, W tau, zeta, nu, and h nu, the decay channels, in proportion to 1, 1. This is a theoretical expectation. It's uh, very general for these kind of models. We are in agreement with this. And we are not putting this um, 
prior to the to the feed. The data is telling us this. This is the proportion, and also that we need to feed the MS data. And the lifetime of the gravitino is in the order of uh, 10 to the 25, 25, 10 to the 26. Okay. In this slide, I am presenting what I just talked in the left side. There is uh, the theoretical expectation. Uh, we take the theoretical expectation from uh, the Laje and Greff uh, paper. You can see for different uh, scenarios, you always have these um, this, uh, branching ratios, and we are in agreement with that. Also, on the right side, we, we present the mass and lifetime. This, uh, I don't know how to call this, red band, is the band when you can explain the data, the AMS data. Next is to see what happened, what is the contribution, assuming this parameter of the gravitino, what is the contribution to the gamma ray um, observations? How we see this gravitino in the gamma ray sky? Then to do this, we just use the gamma ray spectrum produced with Pythia and nothing else. We compare, we compute uh, the flux in the extragalactic gamma ray background and compare with the data. And the data come from the Fermi Lash Aerial Telescope. Uh, this is also a particle physics experiment in the, um, in the Earth, in, oh, in the space, and, uh, well, it uh, detects uh, gamma rays. This is the sky as seen by the Fermilat, this is the galactic plane, it's very bright. These dots are point sources or some small standard sources. You, decom you can decompose the gamma ray sky, sky into point sources, the galactic emission that is basically all this, an isotropic emission, and possibly a dark matter signal. Then I will focus on the isotropic measurement. Mm, the Fermilat collaboration have measured this contribution and well basically I'm showing here these are the measurement of the blue points and then you can try to compute what is the contribution for different uh, emitters extragalactic emitters uh, as a star forming galaxies, radio galaxies, blazars and then sum up all of them and see what is the what can left for exotic contribution as star matter. Then we did that. Uh, we use the modeling for different papers, and basically uh, we get these um, brown points are the upper limits. This is the maximum contribution that you can have for other um, for other components. Then we compute what is the flux that produce a gravitino that can explain the, the MS data and you can see clearly that it produces uh, an excess in the extragalactic gamma ray background that is not seen by Fermi. Then we can safely exclude this, this hypothesis because, well, you are producing something that is clearly not there. Okay, then what we did was to see, well, then what is allowed by, by Fermi? What are, what are the parameters that the gravitino, in the gravitino model that can uh, allow by Fermi? Then we just compute the, the upper limits where the gravitino flats is not uh, overshooting the data and then compare with the data. And here we have the results in, in mass versus lifetime. You can see the band, the red band, is what we found in the first part of the world, is where you can explain uh, AMS data. 
uh, but uh, everything below the lines is excluded. We have different lines because we can have different decay channels uh, predicted, uh, well, for all the possible uh, theoretical scenarios, we exclude the, the area where you can explain AMS2. Also, I am putting there the result by recent paper, Ando and Ishiwata, where they also exclude this, this scenario. Okay. And conclusions, uh, well, we have uh, used recent AMS2 results um, to, to characterize the, a possible source responsible for this uh, as a gravitino uh, in air parity violation models, we find that we can explain this excess with a gravitino with uh, one or three TV mass and the lifetime in around one ten to the twenty six seconds. Uh, we find that uh, the main decay mode preferred by the data is W tau. This allied previous. Uh, analysis, but we also find, making a study in uh, the gamma ray sky, that uh, those parameters are excluded, that those parameters will produce a very bright signal in the extragalactic gamma ray background that is not in agreement with uh, Fermi LAT. Um, it's all. I hope you have questions, and um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Carmel, for this interesting seminar. So now we should pass to the to the question round. So first of all, I want to also remind to the people that they can make questions to to Herman, especially the ones that are following via the streaming using the Q and A. They ask a question too that is appears it should appear around this part of the screen. So meanwhile, we are gonna I'm gonna ask. Meanwhile, there are going to be questions from the from the guests that are here in the Hangout. So you can write a question and then we discuss it. So who has a question from the from the guest for Herman? So I don't know. Is there a question? So uh, I do have a question. Herman, can you a question for you. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. OK, OK. Oh, well, I, I see a, a question. In, in One question from Nicolas first. OK, OK, OK. Perfect. OK. Hey, Herman. So my question is about the, the decay channels. So in order to explain this AMS, the, the preferred channel is W plus, plus electron, I think. But in a particular particle physics model, uh, how easy it is to controlate this Decays the, the decay channel. Okay, well, uh, to explain AMS2 data, what we find is that the main decay channel should be W lepton, specifically in the third family, W tau. And there is no constraint on the on the way you broke. Uh, air parity in different families, then it's basically a free parameter um, among families. And the other constraint that you have is it is a cinetic, uh, kinematic uh, constraint about the ratio between different decay channels. But uh, uh, we find that uh, with the fit, uh, this uh, ratio is, uh, is fulfilled. There is no problem with that. And then, uh, in principle, this is completely in agreement with uh, theoretical expectations. I don't know if it answered okay. your question. Okay. I guess we have question from from the Grupo de Altas Energías in Peru. So. You can do the. Okay. Uh, well, I, I can read. 
sorry, my microphone mute. Um, yeah, yeah, sorry. The the the, the question is uh, how how does um, your predictions depend on the on on the SUSI parameters you're using? Um, is is there a way, for instance, of assuming a, a lighter hexinos instead of gauginos that you could, uh, in, in a way, uh, suppress uh, the gamma flux or something like this? Uh, well, the in different scenarios, different supersymmetric scenarios, basically what you have is different, um, uh, as I'm showing here, you, you can have different branching ratios but at uh, masses around 1 TV, about 1 TV, different supersymmetric scenarios predict basically the same branching ratios. And uh, basically, no matter which scenario you, you are talking, well, you, you will produce exactly the same. And other thing is the amount or, or the size of the flux and this is controlled by the lifetime. And the only constraint that you have on lifetime come from uh, the assumption that the gravity you know, is the dark matter. Then the lifetime should be larger than the age of the universe. But uh, regarding supersymmetry, there is no uh, prediction about that. It's kind of pre parameter if you fulfill the, the requirement that is longer than the age of the universe. Yeah, there is no problem in that side. OK, thank you. So uh, are there more questions from the people in the? Yeah, I do have a, have a question. OK, do it. So if I understood correctly, what, what you said was that the basically this uh, high flux of gamma rays that we don't see is what is killing the, the idea. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. OK, so th the question I have is, um, I don't know if they're on, on supersymmetry, but um, I, uh, what, what I knew when this, uh, when this result was announced by the AMS2 uh, collaboration was that uh, neutralinos, which are sort of the favorite candidates for dark matter, uh, they also produce this, um, this emission of, of gamma rays that we don't see is so sort of a, a problem for the for this type of models. So is there any supersymmetric model that you can build in which you can suppress this gamma ray emission? Because mm. that seems to be the big problem. Yeah, actually, the problem is that the signal in AMS is very significant. The magnitude of the signal is very big. And then you don't see excesses or you don't see consequences of this if you are thinking in dark matter, in other, um, in other experiment, in other observation, like gamma mm -hmm. rays or antiprotons, then this is a problem. Of course, you can make like a, a, a specific supersymmetric models or uh, look into the parameters of the supersymmetric model where you can suppress the production of antiprotons, and also you can suppress the production of gamma rays. The problem with that is that, well, when you start to to digging up into the models to, to find an answer where the, the most uh, prominent feature of the model cannot explain easily the data, then you, you start to, to put in something else, no? And that was the, the motivation for for going to decay in dark matter because the first thing that we, you think when you see an sex in somewhere is to think in neutralinos and angulation. Mm -hmm. Then you you cannot do the job with that. Then you go to the next uh, exotic, more exotic particle a scenario that is in this case, for example, gravity or decay in dark matter. Mm -hmm. And would we learn anything uh, in regarding this context of supersymmetric uh, models with the antiproton measurements? Because uh, if I remember correctly, there was no observation of antiproton excess 
Uh, yeah, but sure. The, but the official data that they will they will release it was not released with this, with this paper. Sure, sure, sure. You you can also well we use gamma rays because well uh, it was closer. There was a new release of data, but you can use also antiprotons. Okay. But as first step, we overshoot gamma ray data. There is no need to go deeper in this. If uh, on the contrary, we were find that. Uh, it was okay with gamma rays. Mm -hmm. We should go to the next step to see what happened in antiprotons. Yeah, but basically, since you don't, since the model is not consistent with the gamma ray observation, yeah. basically there is no point in going beyond. Yeah, yeah you, you, yeah. you already see. Well, then you say, well, this is uh, double screw. Well, well yeah. very well screwed here. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Okay, someone has more question because. Now we have a very long list of questions from people that are following by the streaming. So maybe for the moment we can start with some of the for, with some of those questions. Okay, Herman. Okay. So the first one is from Avelino Vicente, from the, he's here now in Ific and is what about pulsars? Are they still a valid explanation for the positron fraction rise? Any progress in that direction? Sure. In indeed. Well, I. I I have here a plot by from paper uh, from Roberto's paper. Uh, you can do the job, perfect. There is uh, no problem. The only problem with pulsars, as I say here, what you can see here, you can explain this with pulsars and uh, with pulsar with nebula. The problem is that there is a lot of uncertainties in the calculation. You basically fit the data. There is not like a theoretical way to to calculate this uh, the the injection of electrons and positrons from pulsars. But sure, this is a valid explanation. Um, but it's it's not like uh, we are one hundred percent sure that this is this is the responsible. There are different models and well. There are many things going there, but uh, of course, for example, the Gabitino can not be this uh, the only source. Maybe you can have a, a combination, some parameter, well, some emission due to pulsar, some emission due to dark matter. Uh, can be Gabitino, can be any other candidate. But the problem is that the data is not able to to say nothing about what is. Uh, for the moment, the responsible of this, but pulsar is, is a very good uh, uh, candidate for this. Okay, thank you. So another question uh, we have this one from Mauricio Bustamante. He's asking, what about cosmic ray propagation models in the galaxy? How much does they affect the exp uh, expectation positron versus electron fraction arriving at the Earth? Calprop is useful and necessary, but certainly there are unknown inside magnetic field, diffusion coefficient, etc. Okay, we, we here we, we just use uh, one uh, standard scenario. The uh, it is called MET MET model, the the MET propagation parameters, and this is a set of parameters which uh, is a is uh, well those parameters can fit provide a very good fit to the uh, boron carbon ratio and then we use them there is uh, another set that is called max and the other one is mean that maximize and minimize the the flat the the boron carbon ratio and uh, of course there are more Sophisticated ways to do the propagation, but they are full of uncertainties. And well, we don't see that. Well, there is basically the fact that, that you can increase or reduce the flux, but we are fitting the uh, the size of the flux in the. Um, this is a free parameter, and with this net uh, set of parameter, we we already find that it's, it's very well screwed and it's, it's one order of magnitude 
uh, exclude, then we don't think that we can make something one order of magnitude lower, uh, basically changing this. Uh, I mean, it is a source of uncertainty, but uh, it's not that big as for uh, for resuscitating the the model. But sure, there is uh, also oh, well, also there is a question about the uh, uh, In principle, you can use Galprot. It's a different way to compute this. It's more computationally expensive. And uh, use these uh, semi analytic models. Um, for these basic things, I don't think you need to use uh, the whole Gartrop code. But uh, of course, if you start to test the. If you find that the uh, scenario is in agreement with other measurements, then you need to go deeper and be more, more specific about this. But with that first force simulation, you are excluded. Don't need to go deeper. Okay. okay, thank you. So we have another question. This is from Marco Santander. He is asking via Twitter that uh, if it, your gamma emission is only galactic, otherwise, are you accounting for the EVL absorption? Uh, well, uh, the uh, what we compute is a the galactic emission, what we compute for dark matter. We are comparing uh, uh, the emission from the smooth halo in our galaxy. Um, then we are not uh, dealing with the extragalactic uh, background light absorption or anything else. Because, well, of course, this is like, well, you have different components. You have uh, the component due to the galactic emission and also the extragalactic emission. The galactic emission is uh, less uncertain because almost in the region of the sky where we are measuring the EGB, uh, almost all the different profile models give you the same. And then this is like a lower limit. It's a very conservative limit and you don't need to make any extragalactic background light absorption thing because it's only galactic. Okay, thank you. I guess now we have a question from from Diego Restrepo. So he can ask you. Uh, hi Herman. It is well known that the electrophilic model uh, were well suited to explain Pamela. What is the status of this kind of models now? It will be equally affected by these gamma ray constraints. For example, air parity violation, but only through LLE parameters. Well, we, well, we, we didn't explore this um, this scenario because we only restrict to the to two body decays. But uh, you can, um, well, it's a different word, but uh, you can study those models, those. Uh, Parameter because while well, they are leptophilic, they are producing a lot of leptons also in the inner galaxy, and they will produce a lot of uh, inverse Compton. Then with gamma rays, you you can you can explore that. As far as I know, uh, for the moment in those particular trilinear models, I don't know if there is a new revisiting of this uh, scenario with gamma rays. But of course, it would be interesting to, to, to see what happens with that, and especially with measurement of uh, Fermilat in the in the inner part of the galaxy, not in the extragalactic gamma ray background. Okay, so I guess is there another question? We have a couple more. One is, I guess. You already answered the one. Uh, what about antiprotons constraint? I guess you you already talked with the with the question of yeah. The graph, I think so. it was. Okay, we can uh -huh. skip that. So one other question is: What was the difference between model A and B when you present oh, okay. the different it is, spectra? It is about um, Fermilat. Well, when you uh, 
uh, attempt to extract the extragalactic gamma ray background, as I am showing here, you need a model for the point sources, you need a model for the galactic emission. Then the galactic emission model is not as easy as you can imagine. And then uh, you can use different models. Then the model A, model E, is basically a um, standard GALPRO model fitted with to all sky. The model B is when you include a source of electrons, an extra source, or you model the source of electrons in the inner galaxy in order to fit a result previously found in, in the Fermilab collaboration. That is that the inverse Compton emission is larger than expected in this part of the galaxy. Then you can use this other model. What happens if you include a source of electrons or you model the electrons in the galactic center or around the galactic center in order to produce to reproduce the inverse quantum measurement. And then what happened? This is the main difference between models. Mm, okay. okay. Thank you. So other question we have here is okay, the, these two are comments and there is one that is if the line searches also constrain your results. Uh, actually no, because well here in the theoretical expectation uh, you can see in this uh, work by Delaye and Greffe that uh, the branching ratio to gamma nu, that is the line, is very, very, very suppressed in gravitinos with masses uh, around the TV. Okay. Oh. Then the, the branching ratios that dominate here are W leptons and Zeta nu and uh, Higgs nu. Then the, there is almost no contribution from uh, lines. Then you cannot set constraints. Okay, thank you. So I guess we don't have more questions. So we 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 thank Kerman uh, and all the participants that were here in the in the Hangout itself, and also in the, the via the streaming that we, we have just done. And OK, we can meet again in two weeks more with the talk of Nicolas Bernard. And thank you, everybody, to participating. So OK. See you, you in the next time. See you.